Hello, and welcome to another edition of Storyophonic, a regular conversation series with tips and tales from deep inside the music industry. We'd like to ask you to take a minute to review or rate our podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on our website at storyophonic.com and on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Now let's meet the host of Storyophonic, Dan Kimpel, and today's special guest. Lily Hayden is a classically trained violinist who's played with Jimmy Page and Robert Plant, Sting, Josh Groban, and George Clinton's P-Funk. She is an ethereal vocalist and a notable singer-songwriter with a rich catalog of albums to her credit. The only way to really survive this is to really open oneself up to the unknown. And I think that that's actually, it's a, that's an aphorism that's applicable to spirituality and every single aspect of life. If, unless you're discovering the unknown, a marriage will get old, uh, a career will get old, your faith will get old, and it'll become dogma. And I try to live like that. Nominated in the New Age category for a 2019 Grammy with her group Opium Moon, She's also an accomplished film composer who scored, contributed songs, and co-music supervised the new darkly sardonic indie film Driver X. Lily Hayden is in the driver's seat on Stereophonic. Hello, Storyophonic listeners, and welcome to our living room of the air in studio, back here today with an astonishing musician, composer, um, orchestrator, music supervisor, artist. She is the incomparable Lily Hayden. How are you, Lily? Thank you so much. I'm great. How are you? So I'm doing very well and so glad to have you here today. So great to be here. Thank yes. you. The occasion kind of for being in our universe at this moment is the release of an amazing film, which has just come out. It's called Driver X. And to kind of encapsulate it, it's a 50-something gentleman who's going through some changes in his life, and he is now driving for a Uber-type organization. And it's really based on the story of, uh, of the man who direct, wrote and directed it, correct? Yeah, Henry Burial, a wonderful director. This is the second film of his that I've scored. And uh, and this one was uh, fun because I also got to write songs for it. And I saw Henry go through these changes. He was waiting for financing to come through on right. another film, and it fell through for the 10th time. And his wife said, you got to pull your weight. So he started driving, and it turned into a movie. So And then I pulled in my dear friend Marvin Etzioni, who is with us in spirit. Yeah. And it's so interesting because, as you indicated, you scored the film. You got to be a songwriter for the film. You are an artist that we hear 
And you also music supervise, so you introduce us to some new voices as well. Yeah. And that's rare because those functions are not usually that unified. I'm not used to music supervising, but I, you know, naturally I have a lot of friends with great music. And yeah. so it's really fun in the capacity of film composer, you know, if you see, oh, there's a need for a song here, and it's not something that I can write. Or I know somebody who already does that really well. So I just pulled in some friends, and it was really fun. And especially Marvin, whose voice is, you know, timeless. His songs are just so great. And when he watched the movie, he really identified with it because the main character owns a record store as a music aficionado. Yes. And then with the the advent of Spotify and streaming, his record store goes bust. And he has to face the music, so to speak. And Marvin really related to it, felt it was, you know, he really leaned into it. I am Driver X. <laughs> so he brought his, his songs and he became great friends with Henry as well. So together we put this the whole soundtrack together and the way we kind of complemented each other uh, was was a new level of our collaboration. We had collaborated on two of my other records as songwriters. Um, and so and actually he and my father, my dad was uh, David Jove who created New Wave Theater and the seminal punk TV show that preceded MTV. So Marvin's band back in the 80s had been on New Wave Theater. Right, the film, um, right. So. I, yeah, that's interesting. I saw clips I saw clips of that. I remember that was very groundbreaking. It was hosted by Peter Ivers. Yeah. And it looked and acted like nothing else on television at that period of time. So that's an interesting kind of through line that you have. We noticed that Marvin utilized a couple of songs that he had preexistent. Oh, uh, no, they were all preexistent. Yes. But I know Bob Dylan I knew from Marvin Country and mm -hmm. a couple of the others that I knew. So that's really cool that that worked for him. But let's talk about you since you're here. There's two versions of a song that we have on the record. It's called I'm Here. Um, every time that I make a note about your playing, I was looking at this. I think gorgeous is the word that comes up. Oh, I just love the way that you play and sing so much. It's thank so gorgeous. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that, I'm a violinist for those of you who yes, don't know me. <laughs> who can't see. And singer. <laughs> exactly. So we get, we get to hear that. But I'm here, your version, which is just, as I said, gorgeous. And then a version by Danny Peck. Yeah, and so I thought that was interesting. Yeah. So uh, the end of the movie is uh, is Henry really leaves it unresolved, and I think that's one of the kind of bravest things that he does in this film. Uh, so there's this, you know, it's this guy he's got to wrestle with his own relevance in you know this new technological age, and where he's no longer kind of relevant in the music business where he may have once been. And now he's driving and he's interfacing head on with, you know, millennials and the world in a way that he really never did before. And he's having problems at home. I sort of likened this as a, like a modern day odyssey where all of his rides are like the different kind of islands that Odysseus goes to, where he really finds himself through the adventures. And then he, when he comes back home, he realizes this is where his heart really is. But it's not a neat, tidy ending because they still don't know how they're going to pay the, the property tax. They still don't know if they're going to be able to survive. And so I, I really wanted to make sure that the song that was at the end couldn't be sappy. It couldn't be any of those things. So I was, you know, so the, the lyric I like is, uh, you know, I'm here with tales to tell. I don't pretend to know the ending well. And I tried to sing it, and it was like, it's just definitely, and it turned into a Sarah McLaughlin kind of sound, mm -hmm. which it really couldn't be for this movie. This is definitely a guy's movie. And I brought in a couple of singers. I knew I wanted Danny, but Danny isn't in L.A. anymore. And Danny Peck is an iconic brilliant singer and he's as great as Bruce Springsteen. He could have been, should have been, mm -hmm. and still is. He's mm -hmm. still writing songs and making great, great music and he'll be back in LA soon. But I wanted to reach out to him, but I pulled in a couple of people who I thought might be like local and the director was like, just not enough of a lived in voice, yeah. you know. So I reached out to Danny and he sang it and he gave it that, that <clears throat> voice and and it was really a thrill for me to work with him. My notes say wounded, yeah. world weary voice, oh, good, which yes. is what I was exactly. hearing. Exactly. And and I know Danny. I've worked with Danny in the past, and and I just I hadn't thought of him in a while, and it was like so nice to get to hear him again. Because isn't his voice just just amazing? And instantly, he's a really interesting cat. Yeah. Oh, totally. You know, if I recall, it could be an apocryphal story, but I think he named Genghis Cohen. I think he gave that restaurant its name. Oh, really? Yeah. I'll have to check my sources on that one. I maybe just telling me that because we were there. But be that as it may, I love that. I, I wasn't familiar with Helen Rose. 
and I am now. She is terrific. I wasn't familiar with Talon Majors, and I am now. And that actually came together because um, I got a call. Uh, actually, uh, Jeffrey Jampool, who manages the Doors catalog, uh, recommended me to this young artist, Talon Majors. She was making her first EP, and she hired me to play on her thing, and I liked the music, and I knew that we needed a song for this one scene. And I just thought, you know, I think Talon's song would be great for this. So I pulled her in. Um, she's actually probably the most social media relevant <laughs> artist on this thing. She's got like 50,000 Instagram followers or something. There is a song called Gimme Some. Oh, yeah. Which sounds completely different than the other songs. Well, and that is a collaboration. That was actually, uh, truth be told, was written for another film called Stuck, which is another indie film that my friend Stuart, I'm blanking on his last name, uh, wrote and directed. And he needed to replace a uh, Fergie song. And so I started listening to the power stations. And I bribed my now husband into coming to the studio and doing his best you know, rapper voice. And then I called in my great friend Vivek Madala, who's yeah. a wonderful film composer yes. and has recently won an Emmy and is nominated for a second, I think, or maybe one to, <laughs> for his work on Tom and Jerry. <laughs> the three of us got together and made this, this song. And then I played it for Henry, uh, the director of Driver X. The scene was basically like his first night driving. Um, and this was meant to kind of imitate a, a, a real life scene where he, when he first started driving, he had these millennials in the back seat and it was as if he didn't exist and they just wanted to listen to their own music they listened to their own music and they put on a song by the weekend you know i want to make your pussy rain often and <laughs> it was so hilarious to him and he said can you make give me some even more like vulgar just as vulgar as possible and so so we, it was like uh, i'm allowed to use whatever yes, words i are. want okay so he's like fuck it suck it touch it love it uh so he put it up on the big real high-tech uh, studio, he pulled down a screen with the lyrics, and it was a PowerPoint with, fuck it, suck it, <laughs> touch it, love it. <laughs> it was, um, anyway, and my husband, Itai Disraeli, is an amazing musician, and he and I produced the main title song on this together, and our production name is The Service Cat, inspired by a very large, somewhat catatonic cat that we met at a Bernie Sanders rally it was slung over the shoulder of a woman who was very anxious, and the cat was wearing a service cat vest, and we thought, that's a good name for a band. So anyway, we're called the Service Cats, and we produced several of these songs together, and that's Gimme Some. You can't invent these stories, you know. You just, you're just telling them. I love it. Uh, you and your husband also have a, a side project it's called Opium Moon, is that correct? Yes. With all of the adventures from having toured for years with George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic and, you know, played with Page and Plant and all the crazy places I've been. My personal playlist has always been mostly populated by world music and uh, like Tumani Diabate and, you know, the Kora music, of course, Ravi Shankar and the Kremlin and mm -hmm. um, Subramaniam. And these are my desert island records. Yeah. And actually, I got kind of disenchanted or disaffected by electronics and after a couple of really challenging technical shows <laughs> where just all of my tracks and the production just kind of failed and I realized I play a 300-year-old violin. I'm just going to forget about everything. I'm going to make an acoustic record. And I called up my good friend Hamid Saidi, who's Persian hammer dulcimer player, santur player, and I had fallen in love with his playing, and I said, we need to make a record. And Itai, Disraeli, my husband, beautiful fretless bass player, M.B. Gordy, the brilliant percussionist, and we had this kind of ancient sound in mind, and it's like the music you would hear in an opium den. There's a handful of themes, but most of it's improvised yes. around these themes, and it's just flowing. I produced the record uh, and, and ended up mixing it, actually, but uh, with the exception of one of the tracks that ended up being recorded yeah. at The Village. Mm -hmm. And Jeff Greenberg has been so lovely in his support for us. But basically, it's channeled. That's really kind of the music to soothe the soul. So if, if anybody's listening and feels like they need something to soothe the soul, please check out Opium Moon.
mentioned before the interview, Lily Hayden, that because both of your parents were hippies, you and kind of countered that by not like really listening to rock and roll when you were growing up. It was more classical music then. Well, my mom was the iconic comedian Lotus Weinstock, who was the first woman to perform at the Comedy Store. And she was also a wonderful singer-songwriter. And so she was writing her own songs. So, and she was best friends with Tim Harden and Richie Havens. And so with the exception of a handful of her friends, she was really just writing her own music. I wasn't really exposed to that much pop music. My dad wasn't really in the picture. He was running from the law, and uh, he was the first person to mass produce LSD uh, and turned the Beatles on and uh, and the Rolling Stones on. He was also known as the Acid King, yes. uh, David Jove. But so my mom was doing her thing, and I was being trained in classical music was on the violin, and I loved it so much. I loved it more than anything, and I, when I would hear pop music, it just it didn't reach me. Actually, the first kind of non-classical music that I fell in love with was the Cocteau Twins, and then I ended up getting slowly turned on to, you know, Stevie Wonder and the Beatles, but, like, still, even as many as 10 years ago, a guy that I was friends with would play me a Beatles song and say, oh my God, that's gorgeous. Did you write that? <laughs> I'm not proud of this. I just think it's sort of funny. Yeah, anyway, I came to this very organically. That's such a great thing. And you, you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, you had to kind of like learn Led Zeppelin songs, like playing on, on stage with Robert Plant and, uh, and Jimmy Page. So I was doing my hybrid thing and people kept saying, oh, you have to hear Led Zeppelin. You, you, know, you would love them. And I'm a little bit dyslexic, and somebody invited me to a Def Leppard concert. <laughs> and I went there thinking, oh, that's Led Zeppelin. And I, with all due respect, hated it so much that I cried. I couldn't get out fast enough. And then when I finally did hear it, I was like, oh, they're, they're great. And then some friends were opening for them, and they invited me down to San Diego to hear them open for Led Zeppelin. I took a train by myself and went and just ended up getting to meet Jimmy and Robert. I invited them to my show at the Viper Room. Somehow, they came with the entire entourage, and afterwards, they told me really nice things and said, don't be afraid to take risks. Don't be afraid to just do, like, just completely change it up. And that was great advice. And I said, well, how about, can I sit in? Can I sit in at the forum? <laughs> um, and I didn't know that they don't let people sit in. That's not something they do. But somehow they let me sit in. And they said, well, you know Kashmir, right? And I said, oh, well, of course. <laughs> and of course I didn't. I just loved what I had heard on stage. And then a couple of years later, I got to open for them on their last U.S. tour, the whole thing. And I discovered how amazingly funky and like brilliant they were. We would listen to their records in the van when we were touring. Really mind-blowing. And what was so great was, as a sideman, I toured with Tony, 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 opening for Janet Jackson. And that was a great tour, but, you know, a lot of that was tracks. And there was nothing left to chance, really. Whereas Jimmy and Robert, every night they did a different set, and they changed it up, and it was really taking risks. And it was kind of mind-blowing to see 20,000 people a night in the palm of their hands, and really just everybody kind of experiencing the unknown together. I mean, and of course, the very, very well-known, but really taking risks inside of that. And actually, uh, along those lines, I was lucky enough to, to tour with Herbie Hancock for a summer, and I recorded on one of his records, and, and I asked him, Herbie, how do you, you've been doing this for 50 years, how are you still excited to do this? And he said, because I never know what I'm going to do next. I don't know what I'm going to play next. And it really was a reminder that this is the only way to really survive this is to really open oneself up to the unknown. And I think that that's actually, it's a, that's an aphorism that's applicable to spirituality and every single aspect of life. If, unless you're discovering the unknown, a marriage will get old, uh, a career will get old, your faith will get old, and it'll become dogma. And I try to live like that. 
I love that. Thank you so much for that uh, for that moment, Lily Hayden. That's beautiful. It seems almost antithetical sometimes to the film music process, where especially with, with major films, things are tested many times, and they're tested under different circumstances, etc. With this film, with Driver X, because it had budgetary concerns, it didn't have a big, big budget to get done. It was done. Actually, I'll just you know, with the. I don't know if I think it's public knowledge, but uh, their entire budget all in was one hundred and thirty four thousand dollars. Wow. So it requires a lot of creativity to make that happen. Let me give a little shout out to the producer of Driver X, Mark Stoleroff, who actually has a film school called No Budget Film School. It can be done. It's interesting to see. Back to your point yeah. of things having to be exact and tested. Yeah, I mean, this film went through a lot of changes. But even in the testing process, though, the core of it is keeping one's emotional innocence so that you're watching a film and you, you're watching a scene and doesn't make you feel something. And my test as a, you know, I wasn't really trained as a film composer except sort of under the tutelage of big film composers for whom I've been recording, like Hans Zimmer and Harry Gregson Williams and Marco Beltrami. Hans's advice was basically fall in love with your star and to do whatever you can to make your star shine. And I take that to mean exactly what he said, but also what I do is I watch a scene without music and I see what I feel. I f try to feel into my body and I like, okay, I feel that in my chest and my throat and my gut a little bit and I feel this. And then I watch it with the music and if I feel more of what the director wants me to feel, then I know I've done the right thing. And if I feel less, you know, with the music in, then I know the music is extraneous or the wrong thing or it's too much or, and I start stripping away. But it's really kind of like I kind of give myself that emotional litmus test. To, uh, but that, again, is kind of collaborating with the unknown. I love that. When I listen to the soundtrack, you know, Why Do You Do It, which really sounds, in some ways, lengthwise, is more like a cue, but it's got all of this intensity and all of this gorgeousness to it. And there's a couple others that I had made that note of as well. I really like your instrumental work so much. Oh, thank you oh, so yeah. much. Oh, yeah. And I think it's such a nice counterbalance to Marvin's kind of really kind of rootsy vocal and then some of the other musical choices that were made. It's rare, I think, for a soundtrack to like live as this one does, where I would put that on if, you know, friends were coming over we we're going to open a bottle of uh, Syrah or something. Oh, I'm you know so what I mean? Glad. Yeah, thank you yeah. so much. I don't know if it was like a what was that movie? Something Cowboy, like with the back. It was like in film in the eight, like a classic film. Oh, oh, a drugstore cowboy. Drugstore cowboy. Yes. Yeah, I think they had a, a mm -hmm. soundtrack. That's true. That was the kind of eclectic like that. And I used to listen to that and also like Wings of Desire, mm -hmm. like kind of where you have these kind of ethereal pieces and then you have these kind of bluesy pieces and and it feels like a nicely curated playlist but for your candlelit you know whiskey or something um when it came together like that with Marvin it was really kind of this happy accident um, but I listened to uh, the like the blue jacket I made notes about <laughs> texting a lie I made notes about and then, you know, that G word, I keep going, gorgeous, gorgeous strings. Oh, thank There's you. something you're doing which is really, really, uh, you know, effective, you know, with, with the simplicity of tone. So What I realize as I study more scores is that simplicity really is key. Then there's the animation world. And, of course, that's not simple. But it's really space. And it's kind of like picking your themes, sticking with them, not having too many. My mom used to quote Oliver Wendell Holmes who said, for the simplicity that precedes complexity, I wouldn't give a nickel. For the simplicity that comes after complexity, I'd give my life. You know, I came from classical music, so I started scoring, and I would kind of write a different melody for every scene, <laughs> you know. And if there was temp music, I'd try to do my best to do a better version of what was in the temp. And then it was kind of like I'd have, you know, 50 pieces of music that were all great but had very little to do with each other. You know, and I would have to then go backtracking. And and now I realize a handful of really one or two melodies and then kind of iterations of it really are what you need so that you have a cohesive sound of the movie. And, and not all scores have a lot of melody. And for a long time, melody really has not been in vogue. But I, I hear it's coming back. And that's good for me because that's really where I come from. Miriam Cutler has been our guest, and Pinar Toprick has been our guest. Both of whom are good friends and uh, and 
uh, wonderful composers. Remember Miriam said that when they first uh, had the women composer organization, she said their first meeting, they could have met in a Prius, you know. They, <laughs> but she said now there's hundreds of women yeah. that are scoring films and scoring to great effect. And that's a beautiful thing to see that inclusiveness now that we get. You yeah. Know, it took a while. We've tripled. We've gone from 1% to maybe 2.5% of the box office films. My hope is that it filters through really organically and that it has staying power because right now it's kind of in vogue to have a woman composer on your roster. But what I've noticed is that this wave of awareness about inclusion writers mm -hmm. and all that, when people are making decisions about who to take a chance on, well, this is an unknown composer. You know, we can afford to have you know somebody who's not a box office hit already. Mostly those opportunities have gone to men. And so now... I'm hopeful that, you know, maybe a woman will have a chance to get in the door there, and I'd like to be one of them. <laughs> Good. Well, let's talk a little bit about your instrument, and uh, you're carrying an instrument with you today because you're on your way to a gig. Yeah. When I think about the use of violin within the popular music idiom, I remember first hearing it back in the 60s, Scarlett Rivera uh, with Bob Dylan, um, just different times that the violin has come in and out of our consciousness in terms of, with a rock idiom. You yeah, know? and it's a beautiful day, David yes, LaFlame. I know that because I was asked to do, uh, to play on a remake. The very first session I ever did was for a remake of It's a Beautiful Day, wow. and I ended up getting to meet David LaFlame. Uh, he was very nice to me. Ain't like it used to be. Ominous. Low voice. It sounds almost like Tuvan throat singing. To right, me. yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and so world that's, percussion, yeah. Uh, that's Itai, my husband, Itai Disraeli, mm -hmm. member of the service Cats. Yes. So for this this score, um, the main character is this music aficionado, and his. And at the, in the first scene, you hear him talk about how Led Zeppelin IV was the really the, the guiding light of his life, um, and he didn't even know music like that could be made, and you know, and he just uh, all he knew is he fell in love with it, and he wanted to pass that along that love of music along to the to the next generation, and that was really his kind of spiritual imperative. Um, so I thought, well, let's do a score that's sort of in influenced by Zeppelin. We did this. I hired the drummer from David Gilmore's band, um, Stevie D, and I and I brought in Steve Postel, a great guitar player and composer, and um, who's played with everybody, including you know, and Jackson Brown and um, and uh, Itai on bass, and and Itai's played with a lot of people also, but he's just a great musician. And we kind of did this rock, this rock score, and it ended up being over the top for the, like, it to me it was great. But Henry really, they were still discovering the movie. And uh, and when he realized he needed to have it be a little bit darker and a little bit more melancholy, um, we uh, he, he sent me some music that was was moving him and it inspired Ain't Like It Used To Be. And, and really it's kind of like, it, it's written for the main character. I mean, mm -hmm. really times are changing. He's no longer relevant. All he wants is, you know, nobody, he's not getting the love he deserves, he wants. And uh, so, and it's really simple. He just wants to be loved and he wants to be relevant and, but, and he's still trying. So that's really where this comes from. And I wanted it to have kind of a rootsy, dark, I wanted it to be fun and ominous because that's really what the movie is. Um, so I got Itai to sing with me and, um, and, uh, and I got him to sing really super, super low also. And I kept it in and, and made it kind of, and, and I, I really liked the blend. And I did some, you know, fancy, uh, and some messing around in the studio with the after, you know, some sound design and stuff. Good. Where, where did you record that? At my studio. At your studio? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you have a fairly well equipped facility, yes? Yeah, I mean it's a small it's a small work studio, but I've got instruments, uh, you know, and uh, and a nice mic chain. Nice. Uh, and I use uh, I finally upgraded to an Apollo, a UAD, um, for your uh, your you know, your music aficionado. You you know, there's so many facets to what it is you do and who you are, you know, as an artist, as a composer, as you know, you've got this great history within town. Question for you about about the film. Do you take Uber and if you take Uber or Lyft, do you do you engage with the driver? Oh, always. Yeah. And now that I've scored this film, I've got a lot more insight. I always talk to them about uh, you know, what about their home life and I tell them about the movie and you know, I have a lot more compassion for what this is. 
Uh, I do do this. Um, I found out my rating isn't as high as it might be, because probably because I'm usually trying to do my voice exercises in the back seat. <laughs> like the howling might have some, might have affected my rating. I just find it interesting, in, you know, this is Los Angeles. And, and you get that with the film too. I mean, obviously the, the folks that you would encounter, uh, you know, just in your day-to-day life, because we, we are in Los Angeles and we, we live in Los Angeles, are generally people with some pretty illustrious personalities. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's not like, it's not like dull people, you know. So it's reality-based. You know, it's very, very interesting. Well, uh, from what I understand, the director still uh, drives from time to time. Um, some of it is for, you know, research for cool stories, and some of it's just because it's hard to make a living as a freelance in this gig economy. Yes, the gig economy. A lot of ways with the gig economy, I think musicians in some ways and creative people are actually more more stabilized because we're more used to it. Yeah, we've been doing know? it forever. Yeah, so not like we went to a, to a job, you know. Yeah. Or, or when somebody says, so what do you do? I mean, you know, for you, that's, that's a very multi-hyphenate kind of an answer. But you make music. Yeah, so I make music. Easy. That's easy. Lily, you obviously came to music pretty earlier in your in your journey. But if you didn't do music, what would have been an alternative path of your life? Well, let me just speak to the early on musical. Um, my mom used to, my mom, comedian Lotus Weinstock, used to say that I learned to play violin in the womb, and it was very irritating. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I, I was always interested in social justice. Yeah. Fairness means so much to me. It's really kind of the thing that gets me going the most. Uh, and I was going to be a human rights lawyer and until I realized that the incremental change that I m- might have been able to affect uh, with that was not going to, you know, it, it wasn't uh, that, that I could affect more change, at least for me, by by moving somebody with music. Um, so, uh, but but human rights law or some kind of uh, social justice work, um, and I still do. A, I do a lot of benefits, and I've worked mm-hmm. with Human Rights Watch and ACLU, and um, and I I'm an activist. So, um, some kind of fairness advocacy. Great, and you've played with so many incredible artists, and you know you've done film scores, as you mentioned in the interview. You know you worked with you know Robert Plant, Jimmy Page, Parliament Funkadelic. I mean, all these incredible, iconic artists. Is there a dream collaboration? Is there somebody that you have never played with with whom you would like to play? People have asked me that um, a, a, a lot over the years, and my answer was always Prince. Uh. So I'm kind of sad. That uh, well, obviously, we're you know what a great loss. I mean, but when you ask me that, it makes me a little bit sad because I still, that's somebody that I really I, I haven't moved on yet. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, of course, anybody. I mean, and and naturally, the 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 gift of getting to be more successful is that you get to you get to collaborate with more people. So. Uh, you know, I get to, I've gotten to work with Hans Zimmer, and when Hans decides he wants to work with somebody, he just picks up the phone, you know. <laughs> and so I would like to be in that position. I'm not sure exactly who it is, but I'd like, I almost got to work with Paul McCartney. I was out of town when I, when David Kahn called me for it. Um, that would, that would be fun. That would I be could, fun. I could do that. Um, that would be fun. Cool. Well, Lily Hayden, so interesting to get to talk to you, and uh, I really appreciate the, f- uh, the fact that you could talk about the different areas of what you do. And I think, you know, your path is a very fascinating one. And, you know, you've, you've got a lot, of, a lot of things to do in your future. So oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being our guest on. Well, can so, I just go back to your last question? Well, yeah. The collaborators? Sure. Now that I'm a film composer, oh. um, there's a lot of filmmakers that I'd really like to work with. Tell. Um, well, I'd love to work with Jim Jarmusch, and I'd love to work with Mira Nair, um, and... Uh, and of course, naturally, some of the the great, uh, you know, epic composers. But uh, and I'd love to work with John Williams. Um, but uh, but I'm I'm really eager. It, it's it's such a wonderful wide world of exploration and experimentation in film, and I'm um, it's really fun. From your lips to God's ears. Yes, I'm in. May it be. Thank you. Thank you, Lily Hayden. Thank you. This episode of Storyophonic was produced and edited by Lindsay Tomasi.
Music in this podcast by Lily Hayden, Martin Etzioni, and Opium Moon is used by permission. Our theme music was written by Dusty Gray. Thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to having you back for another edition of Stereophonic.